Hello and welcome to this British Academy event. Is COVID-19 a turning point in history, learning from the past? I'm Hitan Shah, Chief Executive of the British Academy, which is the UK's National Academy for Humanities and Social Sciences. We play three roles. We're a fellowship of world-leading scholars, one of, one of whom is speaking with me uh, today. Uh, we're a funding body supporting research, and we're a forum for debate and engagement. Today's event stems from our program of work, Shape the Future. This, this has been a, an opportunity for us to mobilize our disciplines and our fellows to provide insights into responding to the challenges of the pandemic. And today's event is focused on what we can learn from the past to make sense of the present. I'm delighted to welcome renowned historian and public intellectual Margaret Macmillan to our virtual stage for this timely discussion. Margaret is Professor of History at the University of Toronto and an Emeritus Professor of International History at the University of Oxford. She's an Honorary Fellow of the British Academy and was appointed a Companion of Honour in the 2018 New Year's Honours. She has a wide ranging research interests from the history of the British Empire to 20th century international relations and her upcoming book War How Conflict Shaped Us is going to be published at the end of September. In terms of the format for today, Margaret and I will be speaking in conversation for up to 40 minutes and then we'll be taking a selection of audience questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please submit this under the pinned comment in the YouTube comments section. And of course, you're very welcome to also tweet during the event and copy in our Twitter handle at British Academy underscore. Margaret, welcome. It's great to have you here. We're going to be talking about turning points in history. I wonder if you might kick us off by telling us what you think uh, a turning point actually is. What's your definition of that? I think it's when you look back two years later or two decades later and say everything changed then. And often what a turning point does is bring together faster things that were happening anyway. I mean, I think there were a number of things, for example, happening before the First World War. There were social divisions, there were revolutionary ideas around, there were reactionary ideas around, there were economic crises. But what the First World War did, I think, is, is heighten them and bring them together in a way that meant that after the war ended, Europe and, and, and much of the world was never going to be the same again. And so I think it's that sense that something has shifted. And the French Revolution, I think, was for Europe one of those occasions as well, that something is different. And we look back and we say, yes, something went then, something went on, and, and it's not what it was. And it, of course, a lot of the changes have deep roots. But I do think there are moments when, when time seems to speed up. And I think possibly we're living through such a moment now the things that we were worried about in our own societies, things that we were worried about in the international order. And I think now because of the COVID-19 crisis, we're much more aware of those and some of those have become much more acute. You've said elsewhere that leadership is key in this crisis and clearly world leaders are being scrutinized uh, across the piece in terms of their response to the pandemic. What could they learn by looking back at the behavior and the lessons from leaders in the past, for example, uh, in relation to catastrophes like the world wars? Well, I think what they could learn is, is, I mean, one of the important parts of leadership is getting the right people to do what needs to be done and putting together, as, as Lincoln did, President Lincoln did, a cabinet of all the talents or putting together, as, as Winston Churchill did in the Second World War, a national government which brought in some of the best people from, from the different parties. So it's that capacity to mobilize talent and mobilize those who, who have good ideas and have experience. But I think there's also a very important role that a leader plays. And I think Max Weber is, is right about this. It's the sort of demonstrative effect that a leader in some ways is bigger um, than anyone else in society, not, not in literal terms, but, but occupies a bigger platform and his or hers virtues and vices are magnified. And so I think a leader who can speak in a way that seems to bring people together can perhaps reassure them, as for example, Angela Merkel, it seems to me, has done in the current crisis, or, or Jacinta Ardern in New Zealand, is very important when people are looking for some sort of guidance and looking for some sort of reassurance. But of course, a leader on his or her own doesn't make history change. We know that. I mean, I, I'm not going back to the great man of, of history thesis. 
And what I think also comes out is societies which have strong institutions and which have high levels of trust among the members of society, which are resilient, are better able to cope with crises than, than those that aren't. Can you say a bit more about that uh, in terms of examples from the past? Well, I think societies, for example, I and mean, I think Britain was able to come through two draining and, and potentially um, catac well, catastrophic world wars, partly because British society, goodness knows, it had its divisions. And, and certainly in the summer of 1914, there was real fear of a civil war over the Irish question. But in the end, I think British institutions were strong enough and the way in which Britain and the British government was able to mobilize both the people with the support of the people, and this, this, this was something that commanded a fair degree of popular support, and able to mobilize the resources of the country, I think, show that the, the British institutions were strong enough. I mean, Britain in both world wars was enormously successful in mobilizing economic resources, in upping production, in, in taking over, of course, the government had to take a very high, high degree of society, but it was more successful, in fact, than many of its enemies, including its key enemy of Germany. And so I think you can see societies which have built in strengths, if you like. And if we look today, I think it's important that Japan ha is a cohesive society in which people trust each other and trust their own elites and trust their own authorities, that Japan has been able to deal with the crisis perhaps more successfully than countries where there's not that sort of trust and where the institutions aren't as strong. And so, unfortunately, the response of, of countries like Brazil, I think, which is, is, of course, going to be enormously costly for the people of Brazil, is a result and is highlighting some of the weaknesses in Brazilian society. And, and, and I think the, the, the class divisions, the ethnic divisions, the racial divisions, all of these, I think, are coming out. In some parts of Brazilian society, are dealing very successfully and some states are dealing very successfully with the crisis, but on the whole, I think uh, Brazil has, has not had a coherent response. And I think that reflects something about Brazilian society. So it's very difficult, I think, to predict how countries will respond to crises, but I think we can say that those countries which have already built the institutions, and I, th I think this question of trust is enormously important. If you don't trust your leaders, you're not gonna do what they say. If you don't trust your leaders and they say wear masks, then you're going to think, why should I? If you trust your leaders and you think, well, wearing a mask is stupid, but you know, I trust them up to this point, so I will put a mask on. I do think that makes a difference. And I think we're seeing this in the different responses to the pandemic, and we see it in responses to world wars. You know, in the end, I think, in the First World War, Russian society and the Russian regime simply could not take the demands of that war. It was, you know, enormously costly and expensive and draining war in terms of lives and in terms of resources. And the Russian state was already shaky. It had nearly fallen in the revolution of 1904-1905 during the, the Russo-Japanese War. And the government, I think, was, was more and more um, removed from the people, very weak leadership at the center. And I think Russian society simply buckled under the strain and opened the door for the revolutions both in February and then later on in October 1917. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, looking beyond the national state, uh, thinking about institutions internationally, how, how do you think international cooperation today has fared compared to past crises? Well, we have more institutions for international cooperation. We have more experience of international cooperation than we would have had saying the influenza epidemic at the end of the First World War. I mean, there had been the development of some international cooperation in health. Um, there was an international sanitary bureau and, and meetings of, an, of an inter international sanitary congresses, which looked at how to control the movement of, of pandemics and infectious diseases around the world. And so there was some beginnings of that. But the international institutions that existed in 1919 were really embryonic compared to what we've got today. And we do have both the World Health Organization and we have other organizations which deal with regional issues, which deal with, with sharing research. And so I think we're a lot further ahead. Of course, what is always the case with any organization is it's only as strong as its members want it to be. And I think one of the things we're seeing today, and of course, I think we, we knew this anyway, but we're seeing it today, is that the leading powers in the world are not necessarily prepared to cooperate either with each other or with international bodies like the WHO. And the United States is withdrawing 
from it, which I think is you know, a dreadful mistake um, because they're withdrawing from a body which for all its failings has a great deal of expertise, has contacts around the world, has a great deal of experience. And the American government is talking about setting up an alternative health organization, but it seems to me this is not the time to be doing it. Um, you know, it takes a long time to get these bodies up and running. It seems to me the time really right now, it, the, 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 the thing that must be done is to build on what we have already. And so I think we, we are seeing real weaknesses and, and divisions within the international order, which were there, I think, before the pandemic struck. But the ways in which it's played out, I think, are highlighting those. And, and the temptation which a number of nations are falling into to blame others for their problems, and it's, you know, they're blaming others within their own societies, that BJP in India, for example, members of the BJ, B, BJP party and government are blaming Muslims, for example, for, for spreading the pandemic. And we've seen what's happened with the United States and China, where they're trying to accuse the other of having created, or, or certainly those accusations are flying around. And that doesn't help in any international response. I mean, the, the one thing, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not an epidemiologist for sure, but the one thing I know is, is that viruses and infectious diseases in general do not respect borders. And so to suddenly start behaving in highly nationalistic ways is I think counterintuitive and, and counterproductive. This uh, question of blaming others or blaming nations uh, is a really interesting one. And do you see any parallels with the past, for example, the 1918 uh, influenza pandemic being called the Spanish flu, for example, which uh, was partly, I think, as a result of reporting, uh, not, you know, the war reporting, not allowing the, 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 the flu to be reported in many other countries. And so Spain got some of the blame, as it were. Yeah, I think Spain got very unfairly blamed um, for the influenza epidemic. And the Spanish, of course, were, were neutral in the First World War, and they didn't have press censorship in the way that countries involved in the war had. And so they began reporting incidences of the influenza earlier than a number of other countries are doing, and, and therefore the, the, it got um, landed with the name the Spanish flu. I mean, I think there may still be some debate about where it actually came from. Um, we may never know there's a possibility it started in the United States. It may well have started in, in, in Asia. I think we simply don't know how it started, um, I may be wrong on this, but I think, we, yes, there's always this temptation, I think, and it's it's not just with, with plagues, it's when things go wrong, we wanna blame someone, and we blame our governments, or we blame minorities, we blame people who aren't like us. I mean, you think of all the times in Europe when the Black Death hit Europe, and who was blamed? It was the Jews or the Protestants because they were not like the majority of people. And you think of the ways in which the Irish were blamed in the 19th century for spreading typhoid. I mean, there's unfortunately a natural, it seems to me, or, or perhaps not natural, but there's, there's a tendency, human tendency, which I think is often stirred up by unscrupulous people who, who want to use it for their own purposes to blame others and to try and fix blame on people. And, and I think often, of course, we want simple explanations and explanations which say there's actually no one to blame it's just a very unfortunate thing or it's a very unfortunate accident aren't very satisfying. And so I think those sorts of explanations will always be very appealing, which point to wicked forces or wicked people who are trying to create things. And so, yes, we have seen through history, I think, a tendency to blame usually minorities because of course they're defenseless. And if they're different from the rest of us, then we can sort of say, you know, that there's something funny about them, there's something, you know, that they're not part of us. And so it's very unfortunate indeed, and we're seeing it again today. And what's your advice to leaders who don't want to go down that road, but perhaps have siren populist voices who are trying to make that case to blame, as you say, migrants or uh, other religions or other countries, uh, you know, what what is the playbook that allows you to play a straighter bat and defend yourself against that kind of uh, siren call? Well, what seems to be working today, and it, I think it's very interesting, is is really a very straightforward talking to people. Um, it may be that we we're reaching the end of a period where slogans were very appealing. You know, we 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 lived in a world, partly I suppose, because of social media where something short and snappy is what governments have tried to get over. And what really strikes me is the governments that have got very high levels of trust 
I mean, I think the New Zealand government, something like 90% of everyone in New Zealand approves of what it's doing, which is, is basically, I mean, you know, unprecedented, I think, for most governments. I think the governments that have very high levels of trust are governments where they have spoken very bluntly to people and said, look, we can't tell you what's going to happen because we don't know. And this is what we think is happening. Um, we're going to do our best for you. Um, we're going to have to ask you to cooperate. And it's maybe we are seeing a shift in political rhetoric where we will see an expectation on the part of publics that they will actually be talked to as their adults. I mean, one of the things that has struck me so much in, in sort of a lot of the commentary in the United States and, and also in Britain too, is sort of the man and woman in the street, the people in the street who are interviewed, saying, I wish they'd just, I wish governments would just level with us. I wish they would just treat us like grown ups, you know, tell us when they don't know. And this is something governments have been reluctant to do. And it may be that we're entering an age when we have a number of things, including international pandemics, which are very uncertain. We simply don't know, and we may have to get used to it. And we may, in fact, in a way, be expecting our governments to acknowledge that. I may be wrong, but it seems to me that when you look at the countries which have successfully managed to persuade their populations to adopt, often what are quite difficult measures to lock down the economy, you know, a tremendous personal cost to people in, involved in the economy. When we look at governments that have managed to do that, it does seem to me that they've, they've spoken to their people as if they expect them to understand and participate. Um, in this collective endeavor. And it's the governments that have not, I think, been honest with people or who've said, you know, it's going to go away. I mean, the American government, I think, is it, certainly the federal government in the US is a very good example of this. You know, the government, uh, President Trump and his press conferences, which have now resumed, was saying it's going to end, the light at the end of the tunnel. And I think that is, in the end, I think, proved to be a very costly tactic because it hasn't worked. And I think in a funny way, I think people would rather know the worst. I may, I may be wrong, but we may be seeing a shift in political rhetoric where there will be a different expectation of government. And we may be getting a shift in, in our understanding of, of the present and the future that we are going to have to live with more uncertainties than we thought we were living with. I mean, we've, we've lived, those of us who's li who've lived in the developed world since 1945 have been enormously privileged because we've lived in worlds which yes, there have been ups and downs, but on the whole, we've been able to assume things will go on and someone will fix an issue. And, you know, you think of people in the past, people in the 19th century, people in earlier centuries didn't have that certainty. And they lived in worlds in which uncertainty was simply a fact of life. And I'm wondering now if we're now moving into an age where we're going to have to accept, even in very prosperous and developed nations, that uncertainty is a very important component of our environment. And one of our former presidents, uh, Baroness Onora O'Neill, talks about the value of uh, governments and other institutions focusing on trustworthiness rather than on trust, because trust fluctuates. And as you say, populists can uh, make you trust them for a short period of time. But in the long run, trustworthiness will out, because if you're bought, if you're if you behave in a trustworthy way, people will continue to trust you. And do you think, uh, in a sense, what you're talking about and the response to uncertainty, trustworthiness sounds like the long term strategy? Yes, I think that's a very interesting way of putting it. And I, I think I, I, I think I would agree with that idea um, that if you show yourself to be doing your best, I think you will be forgiven mistakes more than those who, who never admit mistakes. And, you know, I, I'm thinking of President Roosevelt, uh, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, in the 1930s in the United States. And he came into office at a time when the Americans were very pessimistic about their state, their, their, state, their economy, their institutions, and there was hideous unemployment. I mean, the United States was one of the worst countries hit in the Depression. And I think there were real concerns that democracy would not survive in the United States. And he managed to establish a degree of trustworthiness, I think. Um, he didn't always make the right decisions and he often changed his mind. But I think he survived and was elected, of course, for four terms. He survived and was, and was re-elected because people felt, well, he is doing his best and he's doing his best first. He's not going to get it all right. Um, nobody does. And I've often thought, you know, I learned this from teaching. If, if I said to my students, you know, I've made a mistake. Um, I think in the long run it was better because I think they felt that at least I was trying. Whereas people who claim that they're always right, um, in the end, do you trust them? 
because we all know that we make mistakes. So I, I think trust, trustworthiness is, is a very interesting concept. And you were just talking about the depression there. It's, it's very clear that uh, the pandemic is going to have grave economic consequences. Uh, what, what insights can history offer us? Uh, and even potentially, is there any hope that history can offer us uh, in this regard? Well, I think we know from the experience of the Great Depression and also from the financial crisis of 2008 that governments can and ought to intervene on a large scale, which may seem unthinkable in ordinary times, but is absolutely necessary in moments of crisis. And, and it's, it's a question of confidence, partly. Um, you know, it is important to get people thinking that things are going to get better, that the economy will recover. And I think it's important also to recognize that governments can do a lot more by the way of intervention and, and spend a lot more than we might think is, is, is possible. And so I think we can learn that in the past when governments intervened with, with, with intelligence, when they intervened to prop up, they don't always get it right. Uh, not defending everything that was done either in the countermeasures to the depression or, or everything that was done after 2008. But what they did was keep the institutions solvent, they kept society going. And so I think we can learn that government is really, I think, in my view, the only institution that can do this on the scale that, that's needed. I mean, we can talk about local grassroots efforts and these are very important, but I think to keep a whole economy going and to support a national health system, for example, takes government action on a very large scale indeed. And so I think we can learn from the past and I hope we learn from this crisis as well. I mean, I think we may, as a result of this crisis, have seen the end of this period of um, austerity, seeing government as something that's too big and bloated. I mean, that isn't to say government is always perfect, but I think we're now recognizing that functioning societies actually need civil services, they need government institutions at work, and they need governments to sometimes intervene actively in societies when things look like they're going very wrong. And again, we're not going to get it right all the time, but I think the alternative um, the idea that the market will solve everything. Well, I hope that idea has now finally been discredited because in so many ways, anyway, I mean, we can get into arguments about this, but I don't think there's ever been a truly free market in, in the sense that some of the free marketeers like to think there is. There have always been constraints and there's always been societal input. But I think the idea that the market somehow is this perfect force which will always make things work in the end is, is absolutely discredited. I think we're now recognizing that we need government intervention, we need regulation, we need ways of, of defining and, and working together for something called the common good. I mean, I do think, I hope, one of the advantages, or not advantages is the wrong word, but one of the consequences, perhaps beneficial consequences of this crisis is it will make us think again about our own societies and I was reflecting and asking questions. We have to ask questions. But I was reflecting when I was looking at the brief film at the beginning of, of this, series, this, this, this session about the British Academy and the range of things that it studies, the range of things that the humanities and social sciences deal with. And I think collectively, those disciplines have a lot to offer in helping us think about the issues facing our societies. We're not going to come up with clear solutions maybe, but we can help us think through them and, and begin to look for the sort of solutions that might work. We've certainly been using this opportunity to bring our fellows and other scholars together to reflect on how society is changing. And uh, perhaps we'll come back to that uh, towards the end of our conversation. But first, uh, you, you were saying not everything happens at the scale of government. Thinking about social history, what can we learn from oral histories, personal diaries and accounts uh, of people who've lived through wars, pandemics, and other uh, national disasters. Uh, and also, what's your sense of today's equivalent archives as we move more into a world of social media? I think what we can learn from, from looking at the diaries, the reflections, the letters, photographs of, of peoples from the past, whatever material we can get, is I think we learn, first of all, to, to respect the past and to understand that these were living, breathing people. I mean, they would not have been exactly like us and we would have had some things in common, but other things not. But I think it helps us to have a connection and an understanding. And if you, if you look at sort of macro history and you, you see, you know, tens of thousands of people did this, millions of people did that. I think you miss the sort of grittiness of history, the sense that 
these things actually mattered. You know, the First World War, we, we talk about the millions who went off to fight and, and the millions of women who went to work in factories and take on the sorts of jobs that men were doing. Men were doing. But I don't think we get a sense of what that actually was like unless we think and read and, and understand the individuals who were involved. And so I think just at that level, it's very important. But I think we also pick up things. I mean, what's always fascinating about social history is that we, we are trying, I think, so often to get at the voices of those who aren't always heard. And so much of history is made by the very articulate. And of course, so much of history was made by those who were literate, which for much of history was a very small minority in society. And we're only getting a part of the understanding of the past if we only look at those materials that the literate produced. And so I think what we're trying to do with social history is get a sense of the currents running through history, with social attitudes, how are they changing? And I think social historians have been, have been really, I think, extremely inventive and imaginative in the ways in which they've looked for sources. They use, for example, court records. Um, you know, I knew someone in Toronto who worked on ecclesiastical records, looking at, at ecclesiastical records of where, where husband and wife wanted a divorce. And he found all sorts of things about attitudes, about gender, attitudes about marriage, in, in ways that I think maybe earlier historians wouldn't have done. And I think also the ways in which social historians are, are trying to recover the voices of people, like Natalie Davis has done, for example, trying to recover the voices of French farmers, people who, whose voices hadn't been heard. I think this is really important. And so I think what social history does is, is give us a much deeper and more nuanced understanding of the past which can be missed if we only look at those who write the records, the, the, those, those who are able to write the records. And I think trying to get into the sensibility of the purse, the feeling of the purse, you know, one of the interesting new fields, I think, is the history of emotions. And how do we know what people meant in the past when they said hate or love? How do we know what was meant by emotions? But we're trying to understand that. And so I think through social history, we're getting a much richer appreciation of the past, which really adds depth and color to our understanding. And what's your reflection uh, as a historian about what will be the equivalent uh, archive today uh, provided for historians of tomorrow? You know, will people be looking at Twitter feeds to see uh, how we responded? Are people keeping diaries in the way that uh, they used to? I don't think people are keeping diaries. I mean, I sometimes think I'm glad I won't be around in 40 years trying to write the history of this period because in a funny way, there'll be too much material, but not enough. Um, you know, there will be Twitter feeds. And I think there are some interesting things done, being done now with people analyzing what words that reoccur, patterns that reoccur, but we may not be getting individual voices. And as far as I know, I always ask people if they keep diaries and an awful lot don't. And people don't write long letters anymore. I mean, you think of the letters that people would write to each other, which were like a form of diary. And, and often people took care over them and they would talk about the, the daily round and, and what their lives were like. And we're not getting that. I mean, emails are, are evanescent. I mean, they, they may be stored somewhere and they may disappear, but most of our emails are very brief and, and very short. And so in a funny way, I think we may have less sense in the future when we look back of what people in our time were thinking and feeling, because so much of what they're doing is instantaneous, quick, dashed off. And it's the reflection that again, I think often helps us to understand the past. You know, if, if you sit down to write a letter to someone on the other side of the world, you take time over it because you're describing your life, you're describing what's going on in your life, you're talking about what's, what's happening to the family. If you're sending off a quick email or you're doing a FaceTime, it's not the same, I think. You're not reflecting in the same way. So I think it's going to be tricky. And I think what also is going to be tricky is, is for historians like me who, who have written about um, international negotiations, for example, or things like the outbreak of wars, the material's not going to be there. I think governments in the past used to write, diplomats, for example, would write very freely about their postings and very freely about who they were dealing with because only a handful of people would ever see what they'd written, or so they thought. And so they wrote very freely. I think now, ever since WikiLeaks, People are very worried about putting down anything that can compromise them because almost anything we now know can be leaked. And they're constantly, there are armies of hack hackers out there trying to breach even the most carefully encrypted messages as we know. And so I think the sheer weight of documentation 
And we won't understand how people thought about things. We're not going to understand the decisions they made. I, I talked to someone in the United States who was in the American government in 2008 when the whole financial crisis took place and he was involved in the negotiations about who to bail out and how. And I said, you know, did you keep a diary? And he said, I didn't have time. And he said, we now can't remember, and I can't remember why we made the decisions we made. I, I, I can't remember what my thinking was at the time because we were so pressured and we weren't keeping a record. And I think that is going to be a real problem for future historians. Too much of one sort of material and not enough of another sort. That's really fascinating. And uh, there's a whole field around digital humanities, which I suppose is time to think about what are the new methods that humanities scholars will need to, to make sense of this kind of material. T turning to uh, thinking more about people in pandemics, you know, we've got research which is showing that uh, certainly in the UK, it's ethnic minority communities who've been most at risk uh, or have had higher prevalence uh, f from COVID. Uh, and also research just published yesterday by our statistical office showing that, in a sense, there's a broad correlation between your ability to work from home and your pay. So the poorer you are, the more likely you're going to have to go to your place of work, which presumably means you're more at risk. Can you say a bit about how, in a sense, privilege has sheltered people in the past from catastrophe uh, and how far that works or how far actually at the point that there really is national catastrophe, privilege can't really shield you in the end? Yes, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, people used to try and escape the Black Death, for example. Um, they would move out of the towns and cities when, when, when the plague started. And those were the people who could afford to do it, and they'd go to their country estates. And in fact, they weren't always that much safer because rats, as we now know, carry the lice that, that spread the Black Death. And there were rats in the country with lice on them just as much as there were in the city. So I don't think privilege always helped, but certainly people felt that it would, and they tried to escape from it. And I think we are seeing again that privilege is making a bit of a difference. Well, the same thing, just to go back, I mean, I was thinking in India, British India, which I studied, in the summer, those who could afford to, um, usually the British uh, in, in the upper, upper sections of, of the um, army or the, um, or, the, or the civil servant or, or rich enough to be able to afford it, would go up to the hills where the weather was cooler and where they were less likely to get the sort of infectious diseases which were on the plains. And so privilege has, I think, sometimes, often, I think, helped people to, to survive plagues which are, which are affecting those who are poorer. And I think what we're certainly seeing now in the ways in which the COVID-19 has affected certain communities, that those who live in very crowded conditions, um, who live in areas that are very polluted, for example, are more likely to catch it and, and perhaps more likely to, to, to suffer lethal consequences we are also seeing the well-to-do, of course, working from home. And I think one of the things that has happened, and another consequence of, of the pandemic, is we recognize just how much at the lower levels of society, and of course people have been saying this for years, and we all should have been much more aware of it, but I think it's been brought into the forefront of our attention now, just how much developed societies depend on the labor of those who are badly paid, who are insecure in their employment. I mean, far too many people have had to go to work because if they don't go to work, they're going to get fired. And I think that is a real condemnation of our society and, and the way in which it works and the ways in which health services, for example, have outsourced things like cleaning hospitals to people who are not unionized, who don't have anyone to speak for them, who are badly paid, who don't get, as we find out, proper protective, personal protective equipment. And of course, what we're also, I think, realizing is so much of the consumption of Western societies depends on poor parts of the world, depends on the farms and factories in the less developed or, 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 the, or the poorer parts of the world, in Africa, in Bangladesh, in other parts of the world. And we know that those people have suffered disproportionately, people in crowded factories. Um, we know that farmers in Africa are gonna have trouble selling and, and moving their crops because of, because of the pandemic. And I think we are beginning to recognize, and I hope we're beginning to realize we must do something about this. It's not just a home, I think. It's not just in Britain or Canada or the United States or the, the prosperous countries, other prosperous countries of Europe, that we need to pay much more attention to how the poorer members of society are treated, but we also need to pay much more attention to the poorer parts of the world. 
who are suffering often disproportionately because they simply don't have the resources. And one of the things that worries me is that as the vaccines are developed, there will be, and I think we're already seeing it, um, there'll be real pressure for the governments of developed nations to sequester those vaccines for themselves, to make sure their own people get them first and, and not to pay due attention to what's going to be needed in countries that, that really need the support um, and, and not just financial support, but are gonna need the vaccines and are gonna need the capacity to deliver those vaccines. Thank you. Look, uh, every age feels that this time is different. We're living in a unique period. Uh, and of course, today's conversation and session is to say, no, there are lessons from the past that we can learn. But what's your sense of what genuinely is new? Where, where are the areas where our present age is different and actually the lessons from the past may not be so pertinent? I think where we're different, I mean, where we are the same, I think, I mean, we tend to think our globalization is, is, is completely new. And the world before 1914 was very globalized as well. I mean, with mass communications, mass transportation, um, a linking together of world economies, mass movement of peoples around the world, um, it was a very globalized period. And so I think, you know, we, we, we tend to overestimate perhaps how new globalization is. What is clearly new is social media. And I think the access of billions of people around the world to social media. I think things that in the past would happen in one part of the world and not really be understood in another part of the world, I think now are becoming understood. And things, catastrophes that happened could be perhaps covered up or ignored in ways that they can't be covered up and ignored now. And the, 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 the pressure and the, the importance of social media, I think, is, is quite different. And the ways I think in which governments are using social media and using communications, both for good and evil, um, is perhaps much greater than, than it was in the past. Although I think governments have always tried to use the levers of communication to get over the message they want and, and to suppress the ones perhaps that they don't want. But the ways in which I think cyber war, I mean, this whole concept of cyber war is very new and the ways in which peoples, whether groups, um, who are carrying out blackmail or whether government sponsored um, operatives are using the whole cyber world to undermine faith, to undermine elections, to try and influence elections, to spread rumors, um, to spread conspiracy theories. Um, I think it's happening much faster on a much greater scale than it used to in the past. And then finally, before we open to audience questions, uh, let, let's come back to the title of our talk, uh, which is COVID-19 as a turning point in history. Do you think it's too soon to be able to say whether the pandemic will be a, a turning point or do you have a view as to whether it will be or not? Well, I think historians have a built in objection to uh, making any assumptions about their own periods um, they're living through. And so we tend to say it's too soon to tell. Um, and there is, there is disagreement. I've talked to friends who say, look, two years from now, we're gonna be looking back and saying, what were we worried about? And everything's gone back to normal. My sense, but I, I, I think, you know, as an historian, I probably have no greater insight into this than, than anyone else. But my sense is that this is a turning point, that things that we were uneasy about in our own societies, things that we felt weren't working well, um, have now come up much more to the forefront and, and in some cases been deepened and trends that were taking place. Um, you know, there was already, I think, a sense of unease among young people that the world was not necessarily going to be very promising for them. They're going to have trouble finding jobs. And I was noticing this among students I was teaching. And, and these were students, of course, who were among the elite students, you know, who, who you would assume would not worry about finding jobs. And in fact, they were. And I think we're now recognizing that you know, there's a whole younger generation that we have been shortchanging and we haven't really been worrying about. And now, of course, the COVID has, has made this situation really, in many cases, um, very difficult indeed. Um, it's interrupted their educations. It, it's damaged the economy. And I think also, I think we're, we're realizing the increasing power of money in our own societies, the ways in which wealth has been concentrated in fewer and fewer hands. And I think that again was something people were worried about before the, the pandemic hit. But I think we're now more aware of just the great divisions within society. And, and you know, we were talking earlier about the ways we've become aware of those who 
work in our societies and make them run and make them function and just how badly often they are treated. And I think once these things have become visible, I'd like to think we can't forget about them. Um, some of the damage, I think, will also be reflected in the international order. I mean, I think the damage done to the WHO, the attacks on the WHO, I think, have, have undermined um, you know, an institution which could, I think, be reformed, but I think is very important. And the competition between the United States and China, which was there anyway, I think is now taking a, a much more dangerous turn. The rhetoric is escalating, and that's not entirely the COVID, but it's partly, I think, because of the COVID. So if I were making a prediction, which, which as I say, historians are, are not good at and we don't like doing, but if I were making a prediction, I think I would say that there has been fundamental sort of shift in, in, in how we think about our world. Um, there have been things that, that have been become more apparent that we should have been more concerned about before. And I like to think that we will not simply go back to business as usual. And of course, we don't know if the pandemic well, not the pandemic, but if the COVID-19 is, is ever really going to go away. I mean, there are some illnesses, some diseases, which simply become part of the landscape and we manage to live with them. I mean, HIV AIDS, when that first became a matter of public concern, I remember the panic, this is going to go on, this is, you know, people are gonna die in, in their millions. And we managed to find ways of dealing with it. We haven't found a way of getting rid of it. And that's true of a, of a lot of other diseases as well, such as malaria. So it may be that COVID-19 will become part of that illness um, or disease landscape that we have to live with. And that may make, continue to make a difference to the ways in which we move around the world. We won't perhaps, I, I suspect, be jumping on, on and off airplanes as much as we did. Um, we may live in more cautious ways. I, I wonder you know, if we will ever go back to um, you know, kissing people when we meet, you know, sort of as salutations. It may be that we, we now behave in different ways. And, and as happened in Asia, it may be, it be the case that we become much more accustomed to wearing face masks. It just becomes part of, of what we do. Let's see. I mean, there's a, see, small I mean there's a small minority of people who can't make a cooking that cruise. Cooking that cruise so. So. <laughs> We've now got some questions from uh, the virtual audience. Uh, Rosemary Coppell uh, asks, in the event of an epidemic or violent conflict, what do you find are the causes, uh, what do you find causes nations to turn inwards or outwards to find a solution? Uh, it's a very, yes, I think it depends on the nature of, of the challenge. I think in the depression, because it was something that hit societies very hard, I think the tendency was to turn inwards to try and see what you could do to improve, mend your society, which as we now know was not always the best thing to do. Um, but in fact, turning inwards and putting up tariff barriers and, and pulling back investments from abroad, damaged world trade, which went down very, very sharply between 1929 and, and 1932 and hit everyone. And in the end made, made the depression worse for people. But I think if it's a social and economic crisis, political crisis at home, you, you tend to turn inwards. But if there is a threat, I mean, I think, you know, when you, when you look at why nations fight, I think it probably boils down to about three things. I mean, one is fear. You fight because you have to, because someone is gonna do something to you, um, because you see that your national existence is, is at stake, um, or you fight because you want something that someone else has, you, you want to acquire something. And then there's the third type um, of, of fighting where you, you, you have the equivalent of a crusade. You, you have an idea or you have an ideology which turns you outwards to look for enemies, although you can often turn inwards to look for the enemies at home as well. And so I think it depends on the nature of the crisis, whether you turn inwards or whether you look outwards. And sometimes your response should be perhaps to look more outwards. I think with the COVID-19 crisis, I think we can see that working with other nations whether it is to try and find a vaccine or to try and find cures or to try and find ways of limiting the spread is actually very important. But the temptation has been to, to turn inwards and, and look only after your, your own people. Um, so sometimes what is the instinctive reaction isn't necessarily the best one, but sometimes the crisis forces you to look out. Uh, you know, in the 1930s, I don't think the British government particularly wanted to look out and contemplate going to war with the Axis powers, but it was forced upon them. I think they did, in the, in, in the appeasement policy, they did their best to try and avoid a war because they really felt they had enough problems to think about at home and they wanted to concentrate on those, but they were forced to look outwards. And so 
I think sometimes, you know, for you may want to draw, draw up the drawbridge and, and turn inwards. Um, sometimes the world won't let you. We've got a question from Cassie Smith Christmas, uh, and she asks, in past epidemics, have we seen the utter denial of the existence of the virus on the scale of denial we're seeing in some places, uh, such as the United States? And if so, what can we learn? Well, I think there's a range of human reactions to, to challenges, and one, of course, is to deny it. Um, one is despair. And I think with the Black Death, you, you saw that range of reactions. There were those who said, we're just going to go and have a good time. You know, we, 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 we may get it, we may not get it. And there were those who sort of more or less gave up and said, we're going to all die. And then there were those who said, let's see what we can do about it. I mean, one of the things that I think was was striking about the Black Death was those who volunteered, the people who went around to bury the dead, um, the doctors who tried to deal with, of course, an illness which they didn't know how it spread or how it could be treated, but they still tried to do so. And I think, you know, we see the same range of human reactions today. Um, denial, and I think we, we you know, we, we, we've seen that in other things. We, we, we've seen it, you know, with, with polio epidemics, which I remember as a child, and, you know, every summer, governments, city governments in Canada, for example, would tell people that, you know, they shouldn't go into crowded places, they would close the swimming pools. And a lot of people would complain and say, this is ridiculous, and it's all a plot, um, you know, or it's just, you know, nonsense. And I think we're seeing the same thing today. Um, although, if you go on denying something, um, sometimes it will catch you anyway. Um, you know, a number of those people who went to the uh, pre presidential rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who thought wearing masks was ridiculous, um, it now turns out have got COVID-19. And what is interesting, I think, is sometimes circumstances, the spread of a, of a disease will change people's minds. But no, it's very worrying. And I think, you know, again, it, it, it some, somehow is, is furthered, I think, by the nature of the international communications we have. And the anti-vaxxers, who might have been a small minority scattered around the world, are now able to come together. And I think in very worrying ways, spread the message that vaccination is bad for you and they've already i mean they've, they've already done their damage with things like the vaccination for childhood diseases and now they're beginning to get active on covid 19 vaccines and this is very dangerous because people will die as a result and you know i think it, it's a huge issue for governments i think they have to try and deal with it and i think they have to go out to communities and try and reason with people and they have to try and talk to people it's not easy to do but I think you know the, the alternative of, of being very authoritarian and say you're going to have the vaccination whether you want it or not is not something most democratic societies want to contemplate. And in democratic societies would arouse tremendous resistance. So it is, it is very difficult, but I think it is going to be an enormous problem. It was in the past and it's going to be one now as we try and, and deal or collectively deal with COVID-19. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question here from Matt Gocha. Did the pandemic have an impact on the 1918 peace process? And do you think that a challenge like this that affects people all over the world can act as a unifier? I've, I've been thinking about the impact of the influenza on the end of the First World War and, and, the, um, and the Paris Peace Conference, which followed it in 1919. I think it's very hard to find any evidence. Um, certainly the, the soldiers on the front were affected by influenza, and there's some research being done into whether German soldiers um, were affected more. I don't, I'm not sure it's clear. I think you know the soldiers on both sides were affected. As far as the Paris Peace Conference went and the peace settlements at the end, I found very little evidence that it was something they were thinking about very much. There's very little in the written record of the deliberations in Paris. What they were thinking about was how to feed Europe. What they were thinking about, of course, is how to make peace and what sort of peace terms they should draw up to deal with Germany and the other defeated nations. And they're also thinking about how to deal with revolution. I mean, there was a real fear that what had happened in Russia was going to spread around the world. Um, and that was going to spread westwards into Europe as well as, as elsewhere. And very little mention. I mean, occasionally in someone's diary, you will, you will get a reference to someone who died overnight. You know, this is the, the, the Spanish flu um, tended to affect young men. Uh, and young people between about 28 and 32, often people in the prime of life. And what was terrifying about it was that it, they died very quickly. But very little in the deliberations that I've come across, and, and strikingly very little in 
the writing of the 1920s. You don't get poets or painters or artists of other sorts writing about the influenza. And I I'm, can only think, and I may be wrong, but I've been thinking about this, that it was possible that they lived in a world in which more people did die of disease. You know, people died of things that people don't die of today. I mean, my both my grandfathers who were in the First World War had mothers who died in childbirth. And that was simply something that happened. And so death, I think, was more, death, death of younger and fit people was more prevalent, I think, than it is today. And of course, they'd just come out of a war in which possibly nine million men had been killed. And so more death, in a way, was, was, was something that, that just added to that sense of loss, but it was not a particular catastrophe in the way that perhaps what we're going through today is. Now, an interesting question from Nigel Todd. Are turning points and crises full of uncertainties about familiar institutions and worldviews also likely to generate millenarian religious frenzies fixated on the fulfillment of ancient prophecies? Um, I mean, I think you can take that in a slightly broader sense, but, you know, what, 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 what might this unleash uh, in terms of uh, religious fanaticism or kind of cults or all of those sorts of uh, behaviours where people are looking for more certainty? Well, yes, it, I mean, it's happened before in the past, hasn't it, that you get people saying this is punishment for what we've done. And you've got this very odd phenomenon in the 14th century with, with the Black Death of the Flagellants, who said this is God's punishment, and who went around beating themselves often until they collapsed and, and in some cases died um, as a way of expiating the sins of the sins of their sins or the sins of, sins of society. And I think there are always those who will who think in an apocalyptic way, who will pick on an event and say this is the punishment for what we have done. And so it'll be interesting to see if we do get these sort of millenarial um, movements. I mean, I'm trying to think if we've, if we've seen any yet. I mean, perhaps some of you may know, have we had people saying this is a punishment for the excesses of society or because we've done wrong things? Or I mean, we've certainly had people saying this is in a way nature's punishment, but I think in a way that's an understandable argument that we have, um, destroyed so many of the natural habitats of beasts and we're living much closer to a lot of um, what wild animals and, and, and beasts um, of various sorts of mammals and so on than we used to and that we are eating things which perhaps we might not have eaten before that it has become easier for diseases like the COVID-19 and like SARS before it to skip from animals or birds into human beings. But that seems to me is, is actually a rational observation. It's based on, on observation. So I don't think it's quite the same. It's not saying we deserve to be punished. But maybe, you know, as they say, watch this spot. Maybe in the next few years, we will see some religious cults or some movements growing up, which, which do use this as an excuse to, to condemn humanity or, or claim that we're heading in a dreadful way. And I suppose the flip side of this uh, next question is um, that, you know, a lot of the focus has been about the impact on our physical health. But is there anything we can learn from the past about how we can manage our mental health in these difficult times? Yes, I don't know, um, because the past is a different country and people, I think, reacted in different ways and had different expectations. Um, what we can learn, I think, from the past is the capacity of people to be altruistic and to work together. I mean, we, we tend, I think, too often to see, and perhaps that's, I, I, I shouldn't say this, maybe it, sometimes it may be the influence of economists that, that we are, are, are trying to maximize our own benefits and our own profits, and we're making rational choices to do that. And perhaps what we, by looking at the past, we can also see, and there are certainly examples of peoples who work together, who sacrifice themselves, the peoples who stayed in the plague-ridden cities, for example, the people, the medical personnel, and others who worked in, in the giant infirmaries in the Spanish influenza, often at the cost of their own lives. And so perhaps when we look at the past, we can see a capacity for communities and for people as individuals to come together and work to try and deal with these sorts of challenges. I mean, we see it, ironically enough, in wartime as well. Um, you know, you see people um, pulling together in societies under threat 
in ways that they might not in peacetime. You know, I, I think George Orwell famously said, and I'm only paraphrasing, you know, that he didn't like much about England, he objected to much of it, but when it was under attack, he felt he would support it and, and defend it, um, although he reserved a right to criticize it. So I think if we look at the past, you know, we should not just look at the bleak picture, we should look at the times when people did, in a sense, pull together and, and, and help each other and support each other, and remember that as well. And probably the final question, uh, and this one is uh, slightly tricky to interpret, but let me read it out and then we can try and make sense of it. How do you see the reactionary forces, such as what is happening with Trump and the use of federal police, reacting to current political realities? Now, I, I wonder whether the, the way to interpret this is how, how are some of our more uh, kind of either dictatorial or populist leaders uh, I mean, I, I'm thinking of Bolsonaro as well, uh, having to come to terms with uh, a situation which obviously they cannot control. Yes, I suppose you would like to think it makes them think twice. It makes them, it humbles them. And in fact, I think the reaction, unfortunately, is for them to become even more what they uh, as they are. And I think, unfortunately, what we're seeing is a number of authoritarian leaders using the excuse of the crisis to do things they want to do anyway. Um, for example, the way Erdogan is taking the opportunity to extend his control over Turkish society and, and, and to um, extend Turkish influence abroad. Um, the way the Chinese, I think, are using the occasion to extend their control over Hong Kong and, and to continue to, to persecute, persecute the Uyghur. And so unfortunately, I don't think leaders will always react um, rationally or, or, or accept that they can't control everything. I mean, we see, I mean, I, th I think what we have to hope is that in democratic countries and, and, and countries that, that have strong social institutions, that even leaders who, who are not, I think, um, well-intentioned and, and who have authoritarian tendencies will be limited by what they can do. And I suppose we should take some comfort from the fact that President Trump has, in his last press conference said that wearing masks was now a good thing. Um, but I think it's he's done a lot of damage along the way. Um, and I do think, you know, the crises, crises are times when, when those who are ruthless enough will try and, and use them for their own ends and seize more power. And that I think is very worrying indeed. Well, that's a sobering note upon which to end. Uh, look, uh, it's been a privilege to have such a wide ranging conversation with you, Margaret. And uh, I suppose on the more optimistic side, the thing that I take away from this is the importance of institutions and trust uh, and the way that the pandemic is, in a sense, uncovering trends and issues that were already there. Uh, I was fascinated by your point that you wouldn't want to be a historian in 40 years time trying to make sense of today. Uh, well, let's leave that for future historians uh, in the British Academy and other places to worry about. I was very pleased uh, to slightly selfishly pin you down against your better judgment to, to say that COVID is a turning point in history. And I hope we might come back again in five years time to see what the kind of early trends and signs are about as to whether you were right or not. So let me thank you so much for for joining me today and thank also our virtual audience uh, who've borne with us uh, in these strange circumstances and just a, a note to to all of you out there do subscribe to the british newsletter british academy's newsletter and social media channels to hear more about the events and the policy work that we're doing uh, both around the pandemic and around the wider impact of our disciplines thank you very much thank you